Good morning, everyone. It is so good to be with you this morning and to bring another message from God's holy word to you. I have to tell you, I am really missing all of you in being with your company. It has been hard for me to know that we cannot be physically together, but I want you to know how much I love you and how much I care for you and how much I've been praying for you that all of us will stay safe during this time. This is the best that we can do at this time is socially distance and stay safe at home. And I appreciate all of your doing that. I want to also say that I've been teaching someone for over a year whom I have come to know and to love dearly, and that is David. And yesterday he was baptized into Christ, and I got to observe that from 20 feet away. And uh, my wife and I rejoiced with the Buttry family, with Danny, his wife, and we are all so excited about walking together with David in this journey. If you have your Bibles with you or your uh, phones and you've got a Bible on there electronically, why don't you turn to Philippians, the third chapter. We're going to spend some time in Philippians 3 and also in Colossians 3, which in my Bible are two pages away from each other. So you can turn there at this time while I ask you this question. Have you ever known someone who has made you feel completely right inside? Someone who has made you a better person for just being around them? Who has caused you to be inspired to a greater life, greater things, and who just simply makes you feel at home when you are with them. The value of knowing someone like this is sometimes beyond description. But now for the second question, do you know Jesus in this way? I'm not asking the question, do you know who Jesus is? I know who Abraham Lincoln is and I admire him greatly. But I did not know Abraham Lincoln as a close friend, obviously. My question to all of us today is, do we know Jesus? In Philippians, the third chapter, Paul expresses his feelings about knowing Jesus in this way. He speaks of his evolution as well in knowing other things first in his life and how in those things he had earlier found great confidence. Others praised him and held him in high esteem for these things that he had found in his life. They were in a real and true sense his identity. But Paul, as you know, earlier called Saul of Tarsus, had this total blinded by light conversion, this total transformation, if you will, a revolution in his life that brought him into a relationship that changed everything and especially his identity. So now let's begin reading in Philippians, the third chapter and in verse four for just a moment. And You'll notice that after Paul is warning these Philippians about certain individuals who are infiltrating their church and trying to get them to be troubled with their standing in God and shake their confidence in Jesus Christ, he says these words, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law found blameless. Just contemplate those words. 
what Paul had found or what Saul of Tarsus had found in his earlier existence was profoundly interesting from his point of view because he in every sense, and maybe this is why God chose him to do such a great work, he was in every sense the perfect Jew. Can you imagine being blameless under the law of Moses? There are a lot of laws there. That doesn't mean that he was perfect and sinless, but that does mean that whatever the law asked him to do, he did it. No one could have attained more than he accomplished in Judaism, but that was Paul's earlier identity. That was his earlier glory and fame, so to speak, and there was no one better at it than Saul of Tarsus. But now listen to what Paul says. Verse 7, but whatever things were gained to me, those I have counted as lost for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him and having a righteousness of my own derived and not having a righteousness, excuse me, of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Think back for a moment on your earlier life, your life before coming to Christ. Maybe it wasn't so full of glory and fame like Paul's. He had a certain fame among his own group, but it was an identity that you were connected with. The problem is, is that that identity was also connected with the world. And that is the most important thing that we must realize. We were all once personally and fatally connected to the world's identity, to the things in the world. And we defined ourselves by those things. What has to happen is that we must now think, as Paul concluded, that all of what earlier determined my identity is now rubbish. It's garbage to me. My relationship with Christ depends on how I view my life before Jesus. And that must be this, that all of what I was tied to is worth losing for the great value of knowing Christ Jesus. I believe in these five short verses that we just read, they tell us how to truly know Jesus, know him like a person who makes you feel right inside. Know him as a person who inspires you to greater things and know him as one who makes you feel at home with who you are becoming and who you are in him. We sing what a friend we have in Jesus. But I know me, it's hard for me to think of Jesus as my friend. It's easier to think of him as the creator of the entire universe, as the mighty God, as the wonderful counselor. It's easy for me to think of him as my savior, but knowing him as a friend, isn't he too great? Isn't he too lofty to be my friend? How do we know Christ Jesus in this way? Well, Paul says it happens as a process. 
And the first thing he indicates is that we have to count everything as loss. Secondly, that we have to recognize that our trust in life is not in what we have accomplished in not in our identity, especially as it is tied to the world. Thirdly, that we have to experience the power of a revolution, of a transformation, of a resurrection. I have to be reborn to a new identity. All three of these ideas, of course, are connected with one another. I can look at all of my earthly achievements before Christ as a total loss, not because they were of no value to me in growth as a person, but because none of these achievements ever brought me to righteousness before God and a relationship with God. And none of these achievements by themselves could ever bring about a resurrection of my spirit, which was killed by my sin. The power of a new life in Jesus is connected to the power of Jesus's resurrection, according to verse 10. This is what Peter was talking about in 1 Peter 1 and verse 3, when he said, Blessed be the Lord, Father, or God of our Father and Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Everything we did before Jesus's power of resurrection in our lives was destined to bring about a lifeless hope. No matter how famous it was, no matter how infamous it was, no matter how meaningless it might have been or meaningful, because none of it would ever translate into life after death. No wonder Jesus stated to Nicodemus that unless we are born again, we cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. We cannot see the kingdom of heaven. As Paul says, the most important aspect of his transformation is the value now of knowing Christ. And this is what we must understand in our new walk with Jesus, that knowing Jesus is now knowing who we truly are. Our new identity then is matched with Jesus's identity as the perfect man when he was on earth. Why is this so important? Because it changes our purpose in life to know that I own a new identity. For Saul of Tarsus, he actually ended up with a new name, Paul. That identity, as we have said before, is conformed to the image of one who created us. So as we often say, we are now image bearers of Jesus. So look at Colossians 3, 1 through 4, as we read this together. Just turn over a couple of pages in your Bible. That's the way it is in mine. And now you're in Colossians 3, and it says these words in verse 1. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things of this earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life or our life, is revealed, then you will also be revealed with him in glory. Look at the beauty of this. The resurrection, he says, that we've had in verse 1, if we have been raised up in Christ. That's not talking about the final resurrection of the dead in, in judgment day. That's talking about being raised up out of the waters of baptism to be in new life as David did yesterday. So then if we are raised to a new existence and a new identity, then we must set our minds on the things that are above. For we've all died. Like Jesus died and went into the tomb and came up, we've all died to that life, to that old identity. 
and our life now is hidden in Christ. This is a beautiful thought here, a metaphor. We're hidden in Christ. We'll be revealed one day as we truly are supposed to be when Christ is revealed and when we then are part of that second resurrection and go to be with him in heaven. So when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. It's like a prophecy that was once hidden and now revealed. What beautiful thoughts these are. But recognize also that my identity in Christ's life is an identity with his sufferings because we are to be conformed to his death. Verse 10 again, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. And now I'm going to make a statement that may surprise you, but I truly believe that we must meditate on this concept, on this truth, or we will not be changed by it. Mere knowledge of some truths is not enough. Only meditation, only a dwelling of the mind on a certain concept will bring us to a clear understanding of how we can be conformed to his death and embrace the sufferings of Jesus Christ. Why do I say this? Because it's our natural instinct, it is at least mine, to avoid suffering, to run from death. Our natural inclination is self-preservation. But Paul says that he finds value in embracing the sufferings of Jesus. Therefore, I truly believe that we will continue to do that natural thing until we, or unless we meditate on how we can embrace this as part of our new life in Christ Jesus, because he suffered for us. I am not saying that we ought to pray for suffering. But I am saying this, that we must recognize that the sufferings of Christ are a witness to our new life in him and a joyful acceptance of what is accomplished through prayer and meditation. You might say, well, how? How do I embrace the sufferings of Christ in this world that I am currently in when there is so little persecution of government or of other people for being a Christian? Well, I don't think it's rocket science, and I don't think it's a mystical experience either. Of course, there may be times in every disciple's life when suffering becomes extreme, but for the most part, our suffering is bound up in dying to our old self and putting on the new self in Jesus Christ. And that is what is meant by conforming to Jesus's death. Now let's go on in our reading, Colossians 3, 5 through 11. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immor immorality, impurity, passion, evil, desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. The original Greek is much more direct, put to death these things that are members of your earthly body. It's a very direct command. Verse 6, for it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you once walked when you were living in them. That was your earlier identity. But now you also put them all aside. Now he gives the second metaphor. And he says, this is like a garment that you lay aside that no longer fits you properly. Now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self with its 
put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and freeman, but Christ in all and in all. And so now I, I want to say this, that as we put all of these things to death, we come into a new image. We are renewed into this image of the true knowledge of the one who created us. And Paul goes on to say that that makes no distinctions now between us. It doesn't matter what happened in the old life. Whether you could count up the number of sins and it would be greater than somebody else's sins, it doesn't matter where you've come from. And for any Christian who calls themselves a disciple of Christ, who looks back on someone's past and holds them in distinction because of that, looks at somebody's race and holds them in distinction because of that, looks at their nationality and holds some sort of disfavor because of that. How dare you? The image of the one that Jesus just created is the image of him. If you do that to him or her, you do that to Jesus Christ, your savior. There is now no distinction. We are all together. It does not matter what our lifestyle was like before this because we have all had that lifestyle put to death. It has all been buried. It's all the old self. I'll tell you what, you might say, well, how is all this knowing Christ like a friend? Well, when we embrace the next part of this, we then become to know him as a friend. Verse 12, so are those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved. I just want to start, stop right there and say this. Paul says, you're holy and you're beloved by God. How could any words be any greater than those from your creator to you? As those who have been chosen, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, Whoever has a complaint against you, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of peace or perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, in which indeed you were once called into one body and be thankful. I I'm telling you, when you put on kindness, Others will see Jesus in you. When you embrace humility, you are drawn closer to Jesus. When you put on forgiveness, you are no more like Jesus than ever before. Do you remember what Jesus said in Matthew, the 25th chapter, verse 31 and following about the judgment day? He was going to say to us, come inherit the kingdom prepared for you. For I was hungry and I was, and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger. You took me in. I was naked. You clothed me. I was sick. You visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And we're all in this scene going to be saying, when Lord, did we ever see you like this and do this for you? And he's going to say these words when you did it to the least of my brothers and sisters, you did it unto me. There's nothing mystical about taking on these beautiful things of Christ and clothing us, as Dan said today, with humility and compassion and kindness, but they are hard. 
sometimes. And that, that difficulty of having patience and showing agape love is really conforming to Jesus's death and fellowshipping in his sufferings. There is nothing mystical about this, especially when you understand the profound truth that Jesus said in John. You are my friends if you do what I command you. These are the words we must meditate upon and be sure and be assured of knowing that the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings and being conformed to his death is truly ours. I know that it is difficult to think of Jesus as our best friend in life, especially when you're trying to wrap your head around the fact that he's the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And the picture that we see of him in Revelation is one that made John fall to his knees as if he were a dead man. How can we have both? Well, there's a song that's very famous called I Can Only Imagine. I love this song because it, it just explains how we're all going to feel and we all do feel coming into contact with Jesus Christ, surrounded by your glory. What will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. I can only imagine. We all feel this way. We're just so in awe of his majesty that we can't fathom how we can embrace him as a friend. But I want you to think of this. When Adam and Eve, after sinning, heard the sound of Jehovah God coming into the garden and walking in the garden in the cool of the day, they hid because they were ashamed because of their sin. And they knew they could not be with him the way they had walked with him before but there is no reason for one who is raised up in Christ to feel that way. We are those who walk before God as Adam and Eve walked before the fall. Paul joyously stated in Romans, the eighth chapter in verse one, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So we can let him see us through and through like a best friend does and still loves us. We can with confidence say he is mine and I am his. Can you only imagine knowing Jesus or can you fully feel knowing him as your best friend, like a wonderful friend, like one who inspires you and makes you a better person, a one who makes you feel at home. Contemplate it and recognize like the old hymn says, and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Awesome thoughts for us to meditate upon this next week and throughout our walk as a disciple. And now I'll give the podium over to my brother, Kirk.